Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to welc welcome everyone to our final workshop of 2016. It has to do with pilot program for lead service lateral replacement. So with that, I will turn it over to City Manager Roloff. Uh, I'm probably going to probably turn it over to Mr. <laughs> Robbie, uh, but this is something that uh, we've reported to Council previously about uh, uh, lead service, uh, not technically a grant program, but it's a loan program that we were recently awarded a half million dollars, and we're going to talk about what studies we've done to uh, to investigate where we where we go from here with this program. Jim, James. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, it's you know a good statement. You know the. Um, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources uh, notified municipalities earlier this year that they had um, some additional funding available through the Safe Drinking Water Loan Program that they're making available as principal forgiveness loans, essentially a grant. Um, and the only reason that that money was available was because they had not fully utilized their allotment of principal forgiveness dollars in previous years. So. Um, they <coughs> were using that um, to really kind of help municipalities get a jump start on trying to, you know, get a handle on, you know, lead water services in the community, not only on the public side, but on the private side. And the intent of this funding program is really to help municipalities help the private side, the private property owners replace uh, their lead services where they have them. Um, so we have been, as staff, we've been working with staff from CH2M Hill. Um, CH2M Hill does a lot of work for us on both the water and wastewater utilities. Um, with us tonight, we have Linda Moore and Todd Elliott, um, who will be uh, giving the, the majority of the presentation tonight. But um, really what we're focusing on tonight in the way we applied for the state fiscal year 2017 principal forgiveness loan was to establish a pilot program to you know help us really get a good understanding of how we can develop a, a good effective program you know we, we're not gonna be able to think of everything so we really thought establishing a pilot program and you know kind of getting our feet wet and using what we're learning from our, our counterpart utilities to help us shape our program um, is really a good way to tackle it and then you know, kind of start small and build into the the bigger program so and we want to give you some information on where we're at right now with um, not only our research but our development of some ideas and concepts um, that we're going to be you know coming back to you and for some additional guidance in the future moving forward but you know it really starts with us being able to just give you the information that we've been able to gather so far so I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Um, one thing, you know, please, if you've got any questions at any point in time, you know, don't wait till the end. Just, you know, let us know right away, and you know, we'll kind of try to keep an eye on the clock. I'll, you know, hopefully rely on Mark a little bit because the clock's behind me, so I can't see it. Um, to kind of keep us on task and you know, keep us moving with that time slot. But you know, I want you to be able to just ask them and you know, have a conversation as we go, rather than trying to save questions till the end. So with that, Linda, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, James. Uh, appreciate those opening remarks. You covered everything that I planned to say with this um, <laughs> introductory slide. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to follow up to say um, I'm a senior project manager with CH2M Hill. And Todd Elliott is a drinking water technology uh, technology lead with our firm and it's been our privilege to serve the Oshkosh Water Utility for nearly 10 years. Oops, excuse me. This afternoon, as James said, we are going to present information, background information on lead and drinking water. We're going to discuss um, efforts that have gone in to define the pilot program to replace privately owned, the private side of the lead service lines in 2017. And we're going to discuss planning efforts that target replacement of all the lead service lines in the city of Oshkosh. Todd and I are going to use some acronyms. You're going to see them in the PowerPoint slides and in the information that was provided in the council packet. We'll refer to um, the preeminent drinking water professional society, the American Water Works Association, the lead and copper rule, lead service lines, lead service line replacement, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin, 
the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and the US EPA. All three of the bottom regulatory agencies um, enforce laws and statutes and guidance for water utilities in the state of Wisconsin. Our presentation today is about 23 slides. And about halfway through, I'm going to turn the podium over to Todd. And we're also going to show one, approximately one minute long, public educational clip. And as James said, interrupt. I'll try to ask if there's any questions after every few slides, and certainly when we transition the podium. And I apologize for the quality of my voice. I caught a cold. <laughs> Appreciate you being over there, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> the most common sources of household, uh, in households of lead exposure is lead-based paint and dust from um, lead-based paints as they deteriorate and lead in contaminated soils. Lead can also drink, uh, leach into drinking water <coughs> when it's conveyed in piping made of lead, or piping that has lead solder, or plumbing fixtures that are manufactured with lead. The EPA estimates that up to 20% of an adult's exposure to lead from, is from drinking water. And if you're a formula-fed infant, that percentage could be as high as 60%. Exposure to lead may result in behavioral problems and learning disabilities. Young children, infants, and fetuses are the most susceptible because of their development stage. And other risks that can be um, posed to adults include kidney damage or hypertension if there's high levels of lead in one's blood. The bottom line is, that the Centers for Disease Control have come out and stated that there is no safe lead blood level and that all reasonable actions should be taken to minimize or eliminate sources of lead exposure to children. They also stand in support of the US EPA's maximum contaminant level or lead action level of 15 parts per billion. And one part per billion, for your reference, is like one second in 32 years. <coughs> Lead service line replacement presents a challenge across the nation. Earlier this year, the American Water Works Association estimated that there's over 6 million lead service lines in our country. And the Wisconsin DNR estimated there's over 176,000 in the state of Wisconsin. As council members, you know how costly it is to replace buried infrastructure like water mains and sewer lines. And it's expensive to replace lead service lines what becomes particularly challenging with this buried asset, this portion of the water distribution system, is that a part of it is owned by the private property owner, and a part is owned by the city. So in this graphic, you see the blue water main, the portion of the service line that's owned by the city, up to um, what's called the corporation stop, or the valve. And then the red portion of the lead service line that's owned by the property owner, along with all the plumbing that's within the property. It has been the city's practice since the lead and copper rule was passed, along with thousands of other utilities in the US, to replace the public portion of the lead service line in conjunction with a water main replacement project. Another challenging aspect of lead service line replacement is that the public portion of the lead service line cannot be replaced 
using funds from the water utility. Private. The private side. Pardon me, I misspoke. The private side cannot be replaced using water utility funds. <coughs> it's also difficult to compel private property owners to replace their lead service line without some legal vehicle for doing so. And that's why many communities have revised their ordinances to prohibit lead service lines in their public water systems. In addition to the cost associated with private side lead service replacement, there's also inconvenience associated with that work and the potential to cause other property damage while that replacement's being made. The one thing that we've learned working with the city's engineering, public works, water distribution, water treatment, um, technical staff is that the lead service line replacement efforts are extremely complex because of how many stakeholders are involved. There will be in Oshkosh thousands of property owners who would be impacted by a lead service line replacement program. And the costs in terms of time and money are significant. In the drinking water industry, among the utilities who have started lead service line replacement programs or completed lead service line replacement programs, the number one advice they give to other communities faced with this challenge is that the only way you're going to be successful is to effectively work with many different entities, many different stakeholders within your community. <coughs> We're talking about lead right now in 20 16 because it was a huge part of the national conversation. You are all probably aware and recall the first quarter of the year, the national spotlight on Flint, Michigan, a community that worked to change its source of water supply. It changed its treatment water strategy. And due to a series of questionable decisions, uh, had drinking water with elevated levels of lead. This year, the EPA is refining revisions that it proposes to make to the lead and copper rule so that, and, and part of their revisions are driven by the um, circumstances that played out in Flint, Michigan. This year, for the first time, the American Water Works Association went on the record to say that they support only full lead service line replacement. And you may recall a few slides back where we showed the house graphic. And I mentioned that many water utilities, after the lead and copper rule was passed, replaced the publicly owned portion of the service line that was made of lead. Now science has um, demonstrated that that, in fact, can result in higher, temporarily higher levels of lead in the drinking water. So as an industry, we are migrating away from partial lead service line replacements to full lead service line replacements. Can you explain why, Linda? Why, what, what um, people because understand? Because there's going to be some denial on that, and I think it's important to point that out. What the um, studies that have been conducted by EPA <coughs> and um, AWWA have shown is that when the piping is disturbed, that particulate matter that's on the lining of the lead lines actually gets disturbed and f loosed and can be conveyed into um, the private property plumbing system. Thanks. You're going to get that question, Council. That's why I think it's really important, and th that's we need to keep repeating that so people understand it because there's a misunderstanding. But nobody touched my pipes. Well, we did right at that connection, and once we did that, things start to happen. But we had this conversation earlier in the year, and it was my understanding in our letter that we send out 
where we're doing utility work that we're advising that that could yeah, and the letters Happen. that went out with the construction in 2016, um, you know, we had learned some of those things from uh, AWWA, and we did uh, notify people and advise people that if you want, you know, when the utility is replacing the public side, they could come into your home, disconnect your service from your meter, and flush it without it going through your meter. Um, I believe nobody on the 2016 program took us up on that offer. Um, several, they were further advised that um, the next best step would be to flush your line using your external hose bib that generally most homes have an external hose bib that is connected immediately behind the meter. So if you flush at that point, then again, the water's flowing through the meter, but it's not getting into the rest of your system. So you know, you, you're having an opportunity to flush any of those loose particles that could have been, or particles that could have been loosened, flush them right out the external ho hose bib without them getting caught inside. If the particles end up being flushed through your internal plumbing, then they can become trapped on the little strainer on, on the inside of your faucet. So then what we recommend is if you're going to flush there, to take the very end of your faucet apart and clean that filter or that strainer out to remove any of those particles. So those were kind of the steps that we had outlined. And you know the most effective would, have, you know, would be to allow our staff to flush it at the meter. You know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people are, are not home during the day when the construction activity is taking place. So you know, like I said, we had nobody that <coughs> was able to take us up on that offer. But I do know that several people were flushing at their external hose bibs. Thanks, James. You're welcome. And um, the last talking point we wanted to share um, on this slide is that the um, Safe Drinking Water Loan Program, which is federal money that's administrated by the Wisconsin DNR, um, for the first time this year was made available to help defray the cost of private side lead service line replacements. So they're only helping fund what is now known in the industry as full lead service line replacements. And the monies that the city has received from the Safe Drinking Water Loan Program will be targeted on the private side. And I think one important thing to note um, from some of the meetings that I've attended with the Department of Natural Resources, this funding through the Safe Drinking Water Loan Program administered by the DNR will only be available for state fiscal year 17 and 18 unless the state or federal legislators approve what's more the word? Funds. Yeah, more approve funds. allocating more funds to the <coughs> programs. At this point in time, the DNR, you know, they did not utilize all of their principal forgiveness dollars in previous years, so they are using that <coughs> money from previous years to fund this program for <coughs> state fiscal year 17 and 18. But unless something happens at the state or federal legislature level, you know, we expect this program to only be available for those two years. Okay, we've, we've discussed um, some emerging um, actions with respect to best practices and, and news and pending changes in regulations, all that have been um, in the media this year. But what has uh, taken place in the last 30 years has been a concentrated effort to reduce lead in drinking water with the passage of the Safe Drinking Water Act, the lead and copper rule, which established a maximum contaminant level or a, a, lead, a, a lead action level of 15 parts per billion, the banning of the use of lead in plumbing fixtures. Um, and we know that the regulations are going to change and they're going <coughs> to become more prescriptive. And we don't know exactly um, what the requirements are going to be. We have a good idea and we'll outline some of those. But I wanted with this particular image to convey the fact that this is a changing and emerging um, issue driven both by science and um, by policy issues.
one organization this year that has gone on the record of making very specific changes to the lead and copper rule is the National Drinking Water Advisory Council. And in a white paper that was published uh, about a month ago, uh, they're suggesting that the EPA modify the lead and copper rule to prohibit or limit partial lead service line replacements for requiring water utilities to post all of their um, lead and copper sampling results to the utilities website requiring communities to prepare an inventory of their lead service lines and their location. They're suggesting that uh, for the entire nation, there should be dates established by which time communities will replace all their lead service lines. And they're recommending that um, the lead and copper rule require public water systems provide educational information and resources to their customers. And um, once, go ahead. I, I was going to say, um, in your packets uh, this past weekend, you sh should have received <coughs> a, um, a handout from us. It, um, I don't know if the letter from the DNR came uh, uh, to you as well, or just um, you know some of our, our current uh, items and reiterating. But if you look at the handout that was entitled "Lead Service Line Replacement," um, that, that came that would be next one. Um, you know that kind of reiterates down the the left hand side uh, what the comment or statement was by the Department of Natural Resources. Um, as well as what their requirements or recommendations are and you'll see a lot of these requirements and recommendations are you know things that Linda just pointed out are noted in that white paper as you know recommendations to the EPA so you know we're already starting to see some of these recommendations coming through um, from the federal level to our, our local regulators and you know they're starting to ask some of these things of our water utility which is why we wanted to put this uh, information together so you could see, okay, here's what the DNR is asking of us. And you know, for the most part, we are already doing what they're asking of us. On that number one item, uh, James, <coughs> where um, we say that sampling occurs every three years, our sampling is only, what, about 30 per sampling. Is that right? Uh, for the entire city? Come on up, Steve. Want to hear you loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> I'll move some of my stuff here so you can uh, join me. Yes, uh, uh, sampling is based on population, and it's also based on your uh, uh, implementation of corrosion control. And uh, because we have an active corrosion control program, and our past samples have not shown us exceeding the 90th percentile, we're on an every three-year program and we're required by population to do 30 locations. Uh, they've tightened up the locations. They used to be tier one, tier two, uh, some copper, some lead. Uh, we're trying to find 30 that are lead, lead. We still have to do some copper, but again, some of these things are changing. So uh, we believe our sampling sites in the past have been pretty good, but we're out actively reviewing all those sites to make sure that we get them. And it will be 30 samples. Are we getting better compliance when we ask people to allow the sampling? Well, we'll find out once we get these sites selected and we start working more closely with, uh, with the members of the community. But we, we think that we'll be fine with getting the cooperation we need. <coughs> getting back to the, the National Drinking Water Advisory Council recommendations, um, obviously this, this information doesn't appear out of thin air where do the where how are the costs for this covered where does the you know it's, it's going to cost money to do these things develop these inventories develop the educational and information resources and that where does the money for that come from I think maybe we'll be able to better answer some of the big cost things further on in the presentation okay. because we have have big pieces of that I will say that we've been working uh, with this program uh, behind the scenes, doing a lot of the things that have been recommendation, re recommended in the past, 
including trying to get public information out there with the Consumer Confidence Report, trying to identify sample sites, uh, you know, working with the community, actually making some contacts with our county health department, working through them. So uh, we have some staff available to do some of the things they're asking for. Uh, the, depending on what's coming in the future, that may be the resource issue may become more challenging for us. And I think I know where you're going with this. It's it's another one of those things they're asking us to do things and not necessarily providing the funding to offset what they're asking us of us. But it's good to hear that Oshkosh is kind of out in front of some of these issues already. Yeah, the, the vast majority of the things that were identified in the DNR letter we are already doing. Um, certainly there are some things that we will work on improving. Um, and you know some of the materials that we've presented to you, um, you know some draft website content and things like that goes to improving the amount of information that's available. Um, and there are a couple of things that we'll have to work on implementing. Uh, there was one or two things I think that we really didn't have in our current program that we'll have to put some effort into in order to be able to meet that <coughs> request of the department at this time. So with that nice segue, thanks again, James. <laughs> um, here's an example. We, we did um, put, put together some um, helpful resources. And, and there's a wealth of good information for consumers on this subject of lead and drinking water. And we tried to pull some um, draft language in that um, the everyone working on it felt was good for Oshkosh because every community is is doing what's right for their community and one of the things that we've suggested might be helpful is including a short video clip like this which um, USA Today put together earlier this year. In most cases the water entering and leaving the treatment plant is lead free. When water becomes contaminated it usually happens as it enters your property. More than 7 million U.S. homes are estimated to have surface lines made of lead that can leach into water. Millions of homes built before 1986 have solder and fixtures that can leach lead. To reduce the leaching of lead, many treatment plants add anti-corrosion chemicals. Some of them create a protective coating inside pipes. Some utilities have programs to replace lead surface lines, but will only address the part they own unless the homeowner pays them hundreds or thousands of dollars to replace the entire line. Many homeowners don't replace their segment because it's too expensive. Replacing only part of these lines can make things worse. Vibrations from construction can break free pieces of protective coating. These pieces contain may flow into your home or get stuck in your plumbing, and that means lead could be in the water when you turn on your tap. <clears throat> We're just about to transition from um, me to Todd and the last um, handout that was in the council packet um, uh, and the topic of this slide here is what other water utilities are doing. Um, some of you, uh, and that, that handout includes the three communities we have shown there, um, and also Washington, D.C. Some of you might remember the lead and copper rule issues in 2002, four, uh, <coughs> 2004 and 2005 in Washington, D.C. And every community has taken a, a different approach to um, their lead service line management issues. Um, in DC, as you see at that table, they made lead service line replacement on the private property side um, voluntary. And as a result of that, less than 20% of the private lead service lines have been replaced. So while DC has been replacing the public, um, they're behind on the private and now with the changes in the regulations they're gonna have to catch up on that portion of their program 
Madison Water Utility was featured in the national news this year because um, in the about 2000 to 2010, they replaced all of their lead service lines. And um, as a part of their program, they provided a, a cost share or a 50% reimbursement to a private property owner for the cost of their private lead service line up to a thousand dollar maximum value. Green Bay is, is in a very um, enviable situation because they have far fewer lead service lines to um, uh, replace in their water system. And um, they're envisioning being able to replace all of the remaining public and private lead service lines within the next six years and being able to provide 100% cost share or reimbursement to the private property owner for their private lead service line replacement. Racine is a community that's similar to Oshkosh in that they're just starting in 2017 with the um, safe drinking water loan monies to um, start working on the several thousand uh, public and private lead service lines that are in their system. For 2017, they're planning to um, offer 100% reimbursement up to 2,500 bucks per lead, for private lead service line for as long as their money lasts. So with that, um, <coughs> that background information, we're going to switch now the conversation more um, into Oshkosh specific uh, details. Are there any questions on the kind of national or, or um, general background information? <coughs> okay, Todd. All right, thank you, Linda. So as, she meant, as Linda mentioned, we'll be transitioning to talk more specifically about the city of Oshkosh and how this lead issue is uh, pertinent to you. So we can probably start with the map. I do believe you have a handout with the map of Oshkosh. It's also shown here on the PowerPoint presentation. And through working with the city uh, department and GIS information, uh, compiled an estimation of how many lead service lines are in the city of Oshkosh currently. Uh, the area that are of, of highest likelihood you have lead service lines on that, both the public and private side are shown in the red or salmon colored there on the city map. So it tends to be the older portions of the city pre-1960. Um, newer portions, you know, after 1960, generally speaking, would not have lead service lines. So that's the area of focus as we look forward to a lead service line uh, pilot project. So that red area there represents about one third of the total city connections, so about 11,000 homes. Um, some good news, of course, as, as you saw from that video, earlier is that the city is adding a corrosion inhibitor uh, to the water in the form of orthophosphate. So that has helped the city stay in compliance with the lead and copper rule for the last 20 years. And has also been proactive about doing public side replacements for the last five to 10 years. It has replaced about 1,400 connections. <coughs> when did we start replacing those? Is it five? 1,400? I believe in the late 90s. Um, prior to that, um, I, I believe you know we weren't looking at full utility replacements all the time with um, street reconstruction projects. So I believe it was the late 90s to early 2000s um, when we really started in earnest, you know, reconstructing you know all of the water and sewer and um, thus getting all of our portion of the water services so again that's just to remind folks that that's just on the city side correct <laughs> do we happen to know in our we started doing the inventory this year is that right as far as private side as oh. we're doing construction do we happen to know um, how many people have actually replaced the private side at, at this point we do not have that information um, you know we 
you know, the numbers that are presented here were, you know, based off an estimate based on when homes were constructed. Um, we have asked our water <coughs> utility inspectors as they were out on construction projects this year to make a note of what they uh, were reconnecting to so we could start developing that data. But um, no, we don't have a, a real good handle on how many private side ones may have been replaced yet at this point. Would they have needed to take out a permit to do that? Um, they, there should have been a plumbing permit taken for some of those, and you know, those are some of the things you know we're we're working through with inspection services to try to figure out what kind of information we have available. Um, one of the challenges being, um, you know, if somebody was just fixing their water service. Say they got a leak and a plumber dug down, okay, there's a leak right here. Just because lead piping was not allowed to be installed, the plumbing code still allowed them to just patch that. You know, so, you know, there's there would be some kind of ciphering of the data in the permit system that would have to be done to try to figure out exactly what has or has not been done. And, you know, it's a, a step we haven't uh, gotten fully into yet. So briefly about the pilot project that we're looking at doing, the city's looking at doing over the next couple of years. Again, James and Linda have hit on these to some extent already, but you know, funding was made available by Wisconsin DNR to be used solely for private lead service line replacements. Uh, city of Oshkosh applied for a grant for fiscal year 17 and received a half million dollars. And that money, right now, we're in the preliminary phases of how to spend that money, but initial estimates are we think we can do around 200 lead service line replacements on the private side in fiscal year 17 as part of water main replacement program. Uh, there are certainly other aspects of the system that are going to need improvement, including some high priority customers that develop a database for. I think there's <clears throat> a pretty good estimation of where the schools and daycare centers are. But part of the purpose as we look forward to fiscal year 18 is assuming we do get that money from DNR for another half million dollar grant is to focus in on those areas and get those replacements made. But there is some field verification required to see do, do they in fact have lead and then how much and how much is it going to cost. But right now the, you know, the focus is on these water main replacement projects. That's kind of what the city has been doing to date and is a relatively cost effective way to do the replacements. Um, as mentioned before, there will also be some other pilot project elements. So in addition to the replacements, the uh, city will be setting up a pre-qualification system or mechanism to get licensed plumber to do the actual work on the private side replacements. On the public side, that will still continue to be done uh, by city personnel. The city also plans to issue lead water filters to provide a little extra layer of protection to homeowners. So that when that work is being done, there may be some release of particles into the line for a six-month period. Um, in, what, what is envisioned is to provide a home water filter, something that can be mounted to a faucet with a replacement cartridge that would cover a six-month period to provide a little extra level of safety as well as do some lead sampling uh, just to verify that the water is safe to drink. Uh, there will be some updates to the city website and information to customers um, and also Initial progress right now is to look at revisions to the Chapter 20 Plumbing Code Ordinance to <coughs> lead service line replacement, prohibit lead service uh, in the system, and also establish a public-private cost share, which I'll talk about here in a little more detail through a couple slides coming up. So on the topic of the cost share, uh, I've got a graphic here that we're showing the number of lead, or sorry, the number of private lead service line replacements to be uh, conducted in 2017 on the y-axis there, ranging from zero to 800. And on the bottom is the city cost share, and what's that represented by um, showing the number of 100% that would indicate the cities are paying 100% of the private replacement cost. 50% uh, for example would be a 50-50 cost share, you know, customer pays half, city pays half. <coughs> So based on initial estimates for the pilot program for fiscal year 17, I mentioned we estimate we can do 200 lead service line replacements on the private side. That assumes 100% cost share, so cities taking, using that DNR grant funding to fully pay for the private side replacement. Um, based on you know, uh, estimated cost, about $2,000 per private side 
lateral. Now those costs may come in a little bit lower or they're maybe through to some decisions here, deciding to not do 100% cost share, there is some opportunity um, if there's a desire to, to do more lead service replacements. So again, just want to present that information as you know, a decision point moving forward. When you have 200 lead service laterals, what are you putting on as a estimated cost per lateral? This graphic will answer that question. So we're, the estimate based on the numbers we had, had been looking at, working with the city on this and looking at also what other systems have paid for replacements is about $2,000 on average. Now that'll vary based on the homeowner site. Longer laterals will cost more, shorter laterals will cost less. Maybe other complicating factors at the site, but on average we think about $2,000. Uh, you can see from this graphic on the y-axis average cost per private lead service line replacement ranging from zero to twenty five hundred dollars on the y-axis and on the bottom is the, again the cost share between the city and the private homeowner so for example at 100 percent cost share city's paying the full two thousand dollar bill fifty percent cost share that's thousand dollars for the homeowner thousand dollars for the city and for zero percent cost share that would be homeowner paying the full $2,000 bill and the city not paying anything, just to provide a, an example. So the question being, <clears throat> even if you replace the private side up to the shut up, or the meter, yeah, the meter, yep. the house still could have, if it's built prior to 1969, issues the following Yeah, if um, the lead-free fixtures and solder weren't lead free until about 1984. So, you know, even if you have a house that is, you know, fully copper, you know, I'll, I'll throw out the example. My house was built in 1969. It's all copper, but I know all the solder has got lead in it. So even if you completely remove your lead water service, you could still have interior plumbing that does contain lead. that answer your question? Yes, we can talk you. more. Um, so we, went to, we did a cost modeling program with, in conjunction with the city to provide an estimate of what a full program might cost to the city paying for all the replacements moving forward. So the first graphic we've got here is fairly complicated, but I'll, I'll step you through it. So on the y-axis, we've got annual lead service replacement program costs. That's total cost to the city, both public and private. Blue bar graphs are the public portion. So that's currently what's uh, being done by the city using water utility funds and green being the private side that would have to be paid for through an alternate funding mechanism currently if the pilot program would be paid for using the Wisconsin DNR funds and on the bottom graph on the bottom axis the x-axis uh, in black is the cost share so it's the same as we discussed earlier ranging from zero to 100 percent and the pro program duration is in red ranging from 10 years to 30 years so we'll just show a couple examples here. So for example, we did a 10-year program, 100% cost share. Uh, total costs incurred to the city is about $7 million, which roughly two-thirds of that is associated with the public replacement and one-third associated with the private replacement. Again, that private replacement would have to come from a different funding mechanism. Look at a 30-year program. So the big difference here is you're doing less laterals per year. That's why the cost is dropping. Uh, total program costs would be about $2.2 .2 million per year. Again, with this similar ratio, about a th two thirds of that with the public side using water utility funds and a third of that private side using alternate funding mechanism. So again, I, we wanted to present that to you so you had an idea of what the annual budget might look like. I'll show you the next graph. This would be, regardless of program duration, what would the total cost look like? Total program costs are there on the y-axis, ranging from zero to $80 million for total program costs. Same private cost share on the bottom, ranging from zero to 100%. And that blue area, the big blue box, that's the total investment for the public share of the, of the lead service line replacement. It's about $40, $45 million. Again, that would be water utility funds to pay for that. And the green triangle, depending on how much cost share uh, percentage is utilized, could be as high as $25 million if 100% cost share was implemented for a total program cost of almost $70 million. So again, whatever the city doesn't pay for in that green triangle, it, you know, the customer, as I showed in that previous graphic, is responsible for and could be $2,000 or more depending on the site. 
And then the final About graph. Five minutes. Yep. <laughs> Very quickly through the final graph, I had mentioned that there's different program costs depending on program duration. Um, so we wanted to just give you a, a handle on how many lead service line replacements are we talking about per year. So on the bottom is, again, the program duration ranging from 10 years to 30 years. On the y-axis, that's lead service line replacements, total replacements per year. So for, you know, if you do the math, we've got 11,000, approximately 11,000 lead service lines in the system divided by 10 years. That's about 1,100 replacements per year that would need to be done. So that's the top of that. If you disregard the colors for a second, just look at the top line graph. That's about 1,100. 30-year program, if you'd be looking at between 350 to 400 lead service replacements per year. So that difference is about 700 lead service line replacements per year. So what that means to the city is, you know, it's more homeowners getting disrupted for a shorter program. That's more streets getting ripped up. And of course, that's more money being brought to the table on an annual basis. So just something to, you know, kind of think about and digest as you think about program duration moving forward, making decisions on that. Uh, just for a point of perspective, that purple area at the bottom, that's approximately what the city is averaging now for their water main uh, water main projects and when they're doing the public side replacements, so that's about 250 a year. So even at 30 years, 30 year program still account, you know, still requires an increase of 100 to 150 lead service line replacements per year. So you're still looking at an increase. So to close out, um, the main goal of the, if you look at the pilot program is to gather lessons learned, apply them to a longer term program with regarding working with the, you know, the plumbers and the homeowners developing website materials and handouts for customers, uh, lead filters, uh, get a better estimate on cost. I can envision a year from now having some revisions to those graphics as new cost becomes available. But really it's a, it's a risk reducing project to get the lead out of the system um, and you know, really provide that benefit to the city and, and the customers. So some of the next steps that we'll be looking at uh, working with you on here as we start to look into early 2017 and beyond is, again, get this pilot program going for 2017, start planning for 2018 pilot program, <coughs> uh, figure out where the lead service line replacements are going to be conducted, and through some upcoming workshops, uh, hopefully make a decision on this cost share. You know, that there's a big financial implication to, and whether you do 50% or 100%, so a decision point there. And also potential revisions to the admissible code if we want to make that a, an ordinance change to make lead service line you know, get rid of lead out of the uh, lead service lines. So that's kind of what we're envisioning moving forward. Um, that is the end of the presentation, and we'll open it up in there one minute remaining for question and discussion. <laughs> so, so just to clarify, <coughs> for the public portion of replacing lead service lines, that can be done through the water, ut through the utility. Correct? And we're currently doing that. Yes, we, we have been, you know, as we indicated on our public street reconstruction projects or even on our water main replacement projects like Fifth Avenue last year, we have been replacing the publicly owned portion of the water service where it's led. But for the, for the private sector or for the private end of it, we got to find money. It is if the city is going to fund any of these cost shares, we have to figure, we have to gather that money someplace. Someplace other than the water utility. Other than the water utility. The water utility so, it, so basically, tax increases. <gasps> no. Say that. And that um, part of it is what we're going to do. Or, or grant funding. We can, we can use the grant funding that we're getting. Mm -hmm. But once the grant funding goes away, the point I'm making is, is that this isn't free and that while we do things for the public good we will be having it's possible that we will have to be assessing some type of a tax or a fee to complete this understanding that there's 11 if there's 11,000 of these connections that doesn't you know it doesn't affect there's some people that don't have these issues that in essence would look at this and say well why should I be that's something we will need to address in the future and and that really gets to the crux if you can just give me one second Lori um, that really gets to the crux of why we can't use 
public utility dollars for it. Uh, the City of Madison did apply to the Wisconsin Public Service Commission um, to replace the private uh, side lead services with their water utility rates. Uh, they were denied by the Public Service Commission. They appealed that and uh, the appeals court in the end ended up siding with the Public Service Commission saying because it was uh, selective in the people that would benefit from it that it was in the Public Service Commission's eyes it wasn't appropriate to utilize those rate dollars. So sorry Lori. Oh no I was just going to say it looks like um, in Milwaukee they they have kind of a <coughs> lesser cost I don't know how effective it is um, I guess interim solution they have a public private partnership <coughs> looks like A.O. Smith, United Way of Greater Milwaukee and Waukesha County providing Aquasana brand filters to low income lead service line owners with children. Um, it's kind of a creative mm -hmm. way that they address it. It doesn't look like any of the other cities listed. Uh, well, no, Washington, D.C. provided filters after that. Do we have a sense of how effective those filters are? I mean, obviously, we can't fix all of this today or in the next five years. James, if I could. Yeah, I, would, I will certainly turn that one over to you, Linda. <laughs> Being, living in Milwaukee County, um, there, there's a couple of um, forces at play, all of them good, um, because uh, this initiative is um, um, helping to protect houses where there have been um, detections of high lead and beyond. And part of that collaboration from United Way and A.O. Smith is um, partially supporting um, the Milwaukee Freshwater Sciences or the, the Milwaukee Water Initiative. And part of what they're doing is getting a new product out and very broadly um, uh, uh, getting practical um, user experience with it. So you're right, it, it is um, innovative and there's multiple benefits that the different collaborators are trying to um, achieve through that action. And um, certainly there has been um, the announcement starting last month in November and continuing now about these lead filters, but there's been no commitment for future, how long, um, so certainly very good, you know, can't, can't fault it, but, um, there's, they're, they're not, um, any further along in their planning process in terms of duration and potential ordinance revisions than Oshkosh is. Their situation is approximately 10 times the size. So we are talking about 40 to 70 million here and in Milwaukee it's 500 million to 750 million. Okay. We'll be coming back to council with some uh, ideas on what we plan to propose to do with this money. That's really the next step in that. Yeah, I think, you know, this was, you know, we wanted to get some information out. Certainly, if you have any questions as you continue to go through the information or think about this, you know, please feel free to uh, get a hold of me and I'll work with. Uh, Steve and Linda to get any responses. Um, you know, one thing we didn't get a chance to point out, and I, I do want to point out here briefly, is you know we have been um, also meeting with the community development department to see how we can utilize this uh, safe drinking water loan uh, principal forgiveness in conjunction with uh, the CDBG funding for rehab of uh, income qualified housing, and you know we still got some work uh, to do there, but you know certainly this program can be utilized to help. You know, if any of those homes do have lead services, uh, replace them. You know, certainly at the same time as the rest of the rehab. So, j just wanted to point that out. That was another th one of the conversations that we're having. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the council meeting will start promptly at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. We all grow up. Thanks, Todd. Thanks.